Thank you. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Thank you, Kayla, for that excellent message and song. And one of my favorite hymns, no doubt, I'm sure is with many of you. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. Every one of us here can testify that we were once lost. But now we are found. At one point, we'd been blind. And now we can see. Christ came to give sight to the blind. He came to give life and life more abundantly. This morning, we have a study from the Word of God. But before we get into it, I would like for us to approach the throne of grace boldly, but also humbly, because that boldness does not come from us, but rather from our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. So shall we bow our heads? Heavenly Father, Lord, today we ask in a special way that you be with us as we open your word, and we study the truths that are found therein, that you may have us to understand what you would have us in your word so that we may walk according to thy will and not our own. We pray these things now in Christ's name. Amen. In the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verse 5, starting with verse 5, rather, this is our scripture reading, so if you'll open there with me. Philippians, chapter 2, verse 5, and we'll read actually to verse 8. And I shall read, Let this mind be in you, which was also in who? Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The title of our message this morning is, Are You Pursuing the Character or the Position of God? Different Adventists may give you different answers when asked what brief passage in the Bible encapsulates the entire Adventist movement. Some will give you the verse found in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, the verse that launched William Miller's preaching crusades about the soon coming of Jesus. Others will certainly reference the three angels' message in Revelation chapter 14. Many evangelical Adventists may quote Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, which emphasizes salvation by grace. Now, all of these answers are not incorrect. Surely, they each embody a key component in the Adventist movement, which has continued to grow strong more than a century and a half since its inception. However, the text that contains the key to our mission today is the one given earlier found in Philippians chapter 2. Here is where many Adventists and many Christian theologians will diverge and form groups with different mindsets and theories. We talk about the Sabbath, the state of the dead, the sanctuary, about prophecy, salvation by grace, and even the three angels' message. But somehow, have we missed the forest for the trees? It would be anathema to suggest the previously mentioned doctrines are dispensable or somehow less important than they are. 
They are vital to our walk in Jesus and crucial to our understanding of how to bring the gospel of the second advent to a dying world. No, I would stand here condemned if I was to preach that one jaunt or tittle of the law and the prophets was to be discarded. However, what I do suggest is that we have, at times, somehow missed the point. You know, like the time your father ordered you not to touch the boiling pot on the stove mother put up there when you were a child? At your tender young age, you didn't understand why father kept you from touching that shiny object upon which you could see your own reflection. And you saw white plums rise randomly from within. If you happened to be an obedient child at that time, you didn't learn the lesson right then and there. For you learned the reason as you grew older. For the knowledge of the world increased to where you understood that hot pots and fingers were not a happy combination. As a child, your reasoning was only that father wanted to keep you from experience something that might be potentially fun. Then later on, you realize that father wanted to keep you from getting hurt. Then even later on, you realize that father wanted to keep you from getting hurt because he loved you. As our understanding of the bigger picture grew, the clearer the reasons had become. We had moved past our childish ideas of father being a capricious tyrant and into maturity that allows us to see God as a benevolent, loving creator seeking our best interest. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 11 tells us, When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. God wants his people to understand the whole science of redemption. Why it was needed, why sin, and how sin was remedied, remedied and our final at one mint, being one with God in the heavenly kingdom. This is why he gave the remnant church the gift of prophecy and knowledge of the great controversy. Going back to ages to when time was an even counted, inspiration tells us about the condition of the universe before the entrance of sin. In the Spirit of Prophecy, volume 4, page 316, we are told peace and joy in perfect submission to the will of heaven existed throughout the angelic host. Love to God was supreme. Love for one another impartial. Such was the condition that existed for ages before the entrance of sin. While it is clear from the Bible that earth itself and its immediate surroundings have been in existence for less than 10,000 years, heavenly beings have enjoyed existence for ages before sin. These beings lived in perfect harmony with the law of God. Love reigned and there was no jealousy, no hate or anger. The heavenly beings, in rendering obedience to the law of God, reflected the image and character of the Creator Himself. In Christ's Object Lessons, page 305, God's law is a transcript of His character. It embodies the principles of His kingdom. God's law shows us, and that was end quote, God's law shows us that God's character, what it is like. A godly angel or man will not worship another god, even God himself is subject to his own law. Jesus, being God in the flesh, refused to bow down and worship Satan. So obedience to the law, while not the fullness of reflecting God's character, is simply and certainly a minimum requirement. But let me clarify. While the outline of a drawing isn't the drawing itself, 
as a transcript is not the whole, it is very essential, yet lacking in many respects. This is why the keeping of the law will not save anyone. Many seek to follow the transcript to the letter, but because they lack the heart needed to render proper obedience in the correct attitude, for this reason, the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The character of Jesus is freely given to those that seek it in humility and abject surrender to God. This is why Paul writes that empty works can never attain salvation. Says the hymn, the beloved hymn, Rock of Ages, in an oft-repeated stanza, Not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Utterly hopeless without our Redeemer, we must fall broken at the foot of the cross, confessing our own sinfulness. But praise God, we do not have to remain in such a hopeless state forever. Nor is that change in a state a mere change in legal status. It is a full change of heart, Christ dwelling within you and me, making a new person out of us. Wrote the psalmist, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of our salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Psalm 51, verses 10 to 12. So the question today is, are you seeking God's character, or are you seeking his position? Whenever the subject a becoming like Jesus is brought up in certain circles and discussions. A silly notion is being put forward. Responding to the idea that we can perfectly reflect the character of Christ in our lives, some say that it is Satan who coveted after God in an effort to conflate reflecting Christ's character to seeking to be Christ as in seeking his position. It is difficult to understand why some would believe this way. It is clear that even unfallen angels choose not to sin. Are they therefore guilty of coveting Christ's position and authority? Of course not. And it would be illogical to think otherwise. Christ's people are to seek after Christ's righteousness. His righteousness. But sadly... It isn't only those who dismiss the law as a transcript of God's character who claim to not believe in God, but many of those themselves who believe in God, who follow to seek after God's law, do not seek after Christ's character, but pursue after his position. While those that abjectly dis dismiss God's law and openly sin are guilty of coveting God's position as lawgiver by giving themselves a lower standard to follow, there are Pharisees that still walk among God's people today, placing themselves on a level of the lawgiver by executing judgment on those they believe who are on a slower spiritual level than they are. The way in which, one, in which one dresses is being gossiped upon. Lives are being scrutinized without due understanding of where the subject is coming from. Many become a front to the faith they profess, rather than an able defender and upholder. We do not chastise a child over soy milk they spill the first time. And I use soy milk to remain adventistly correct. We allow them time to learn their lessons from the Word of God. And if we miss the forest for the trees, we become dangerously myopic and place ourselves above Christ himself, for his ways and methods have certainly taught us otherwise. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 4-9 to nine tells us, whereby we are unto us given exceeding great and precious promises, 
that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly what? Almost love. It says kindness. And then to brotherly kindness. And this is another word for love. Charity. For these things be in you, if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. We talked about myopia, which means short-sightedness. And the Bible tells us, He that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see from afar, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his own old sins. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have a work to do in calling sin by its right name. But God has also called us to treat one another with respect and with fairness. For us to call sin by its right name, we should also treat each other as we would like ourselves to be treated. The man of sin talked about in the scriptures isn't just a man seeking to disregard God's law. It is a power seeking to subvert God's authority by establishing a false law and using worldly means to enforce laws both true and false. So not everything that this satanic power seeks to enforce upon people is wrong. But the way that this power has tried to go about doing it is through human means and human traditions and human abilities instead of on God. It is legalistic in that it aims to crush liberty and establish control over others in spiritual matters. It is antinomian, and the word antinomian means against law and and lawlessness, in that it disregards the true law of the ultimate lawgiver. When we talk about character perfection, we are not just talking about perfect obedience to the law of God. We are talking about taking on the full character of God. The law itself is just the transcript of his character. But we must have his full character. When you talk about a transcript, is a transcript the actual reality? Or is it what outlines what we are supposed to follow? If we have the knowledge of the law and no application, it does us no good. In fact, it is much more deeper than law keeping. It is the keeping of the spirit of the law with knowledge and application that the law is the guideline on how we are to love one another. When someone talks about love, we ask ourselves, what is that love based on? Love isn't always necessarily tolerance of what someone else is doing. Sometimes there is what we call tough love. And as we would pull a child from hurting themselves or playing on the road when a car is coming, we should also do the same for one another at the right time. So the question now is, what attribute of God are you pursuing? His character or his position? Lucifer crave the latter. He seeks to lead others in the same path while Christ came to earth to show what the real character of God is. One embodied evil ambition, the other 
dignified humility. One didn't deserve adoration, yet he lifted himself up. The other deserved adoration, yet humbled himself to be like one of us. Touched with our infirmities. When we talk about Israelite kings, much is said about David or even Solomon, his son, one of the wisest men to ever live. We might even talk about the tragedy that was King Saul, the first monarch of Israel. But little to almost nothing is mentioned about Jonathan, his son. Perhaps the greatest earthly king Israel never had. As a crown prince, the realm was Jonathan's to inherit. By the rule of succession, he would be king upon the death of his father, King Saul. But Jonathan did not put the desire for the throne above his desire to fulfill God's will. Jonathan knew David was God's anointed, and despite knowing his father's obsessive crusade to hunt down and kill David was ultimately for his earthly advantage, he had warned David several times to allow him to escape. Jonathan showed true leadership skill many times. During one time, he led an attack almost single-handedly against a Philistine army and sending them to flight. He would have made an excellent king, but he didn't desire the position. He didn't pursue the position, for he was more interested in pursuing after a godly character. And while he died on the same battlefield as his father Saul, we know his eternal destination will be different from his father's writes the pen of inspiration in the book Education, page 157. The name of Jonathan is treasured in heaven, and it stands on earth a witness to the existence and the power of unselfish love. End quote. It is character, not position, that will allow us to obey God's law perfectly. It is the character, not position, that makes the man... And the character we must have is that of Christ. And he gives this to us more willingly whenever we will humble and submit ourselves to him. May this mind be in us, that which was also in Christ Jesus. Amen.